there's a word which I'm a big fan of, and it's called scientism. And it's a belief that if you've got a good formula and a number, you've got the answer every time. Working in this industry, I, I've learned the hard way, having been a guy who loves building a complicated formula as much as the next guy. That, that doesn't mean anything as to its predictive power. Welcome to the Instec London podcast. Matthew Grant here. And for this week's episode, I am back in the Lloyd's lab, this time talking to Amrit Santhasarasan, CEO and co-founder of Hyper Exponential, or HX for short. Amrit is an actuary and founded HX after years of frustration of not being able to find a decent platform for his own actuarial models. He launched HX with his former employer as his first client, and today the company is generating revenue. He's another member of the Lies Lab in cohort three. Amrit, thanks for inviting me back into the uh, Lies Lab. So it's been a week now since... Lloyd's Blueprint 1 came out. I think you said you've managed to uh, move the consultants out, so it's a bit less hectic here, but I'm sure it's buzzing with all the recommendations in there, many of which I think are going to play into what you're doing. Lots of exciting things coming out of it, which definitely play uh, into and influence the way we want to go as a business. Good. Well, let's jump into what you've got on your website, which says that you, uh, you build tools to help people price from weird and wonderful data sets. Let's start off with that and find uh, out a bit more absolutely. about what you're doing. Uh, we refer to weird and wonderful data sets because actually those are what make up the, uh, the majority of the data that drive what our clients use to make decisions. So if you're a specialty insurer and you're trying to price, you know, Tesla or, you know, uh, the PA cover for a, for a football team, the sorts of data sets you get, they're going to be a little bit strange. They're probably going to be small. They're going to be awkward. Um, and you're going to have to do quite a lot of work to put them together to use them to drive a decision. So they're weird and wonderful in a positive and a negative way. Which I guess is at the heart of what Lloyd's does itself, is, is a market for underwriting complex risks. You're essentially just helping them do what is one of the main uh, areas that Lloyd's is offering up to the market. And, and one of the major themes coming out from Blueprint One is the area of the uh, complex risk exchange. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, the backbone of Lloyd's is specialty complex risk. It's what it's famous for. It's what occasionally people, when they do hear about us in the press, you know, it comes out uh, for those sorts of, you know, for those sorts of reasons, because it is the kind of bastion of complex, difficult to place risks. And you're, you yourself an actuary, you founded the business, you've got a couple of other actuaries in here, it's quite a potent force. You, you started up in 2017, coming out of Tokyo Marine Kiln. It has been going in the last couple of years. Great. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, uh, we are a bunch of actuaries. I mean, we build actuarial pricing software. So to some extent, it was inevitable that there would be a few actuaries in the business. Um, we're not full to the brim of actuaries. We're a technology company, so predominantly engineers. Uh, but Michael and I, uh, we are both co-founders uh, 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 and we are both actuaries. Uh, and now we're a real business with clients testing our product, giving us challenges, giving us new things to do. Uh, and the market, as you alluded to uh, uh, earlier with Blueprint One and the, and the future at Lloyd's Strategy, is moving fast as well. So it's great. It's exciting. It's, it's certainly keeping me very busy. Well, congratulations. And having real clients is certainly one way of distinguishing yourself from everybody else that's <laughs> out there. Uh, so we're in cohort three of the Lloyd's Lab. This recent cohort's been going about six weeks. So what was it that brought you with a, you know, a existing organisation? You've got presumably quite well connections into the London market, just given where you came from. Uh, why did you choose to join the Lloyd's Lab? We're also really interested in thinking about what best practice pricing looks like. And if you're going to do that sort of thing, it's really uh, worthwhile to engage with Lloyd's. So one of the things we wanted to do was use the lab to put a structured framework around collaboration with the corporation. That was really, really important to us. Uh, having the lab here, uh, you know, it's been absolutely fantastic for kind of catalyzing those connections with the um, uh, with Lloyd itself. And also it's provided us with a hub for uh, to work with our uh, you know prospective clients and Lloyd's together. So it actually was a very obvious place for us to come because actually what it does is it short circuits lots of the kind of inevitable in in administration in dealing with a larger organization. Uh, and it's certainly done that. Good. And so you, you get the introductions, you get some mentors. Are, are those, when you say it's going well, are those starting to turn into commercial relationships that will continue once you get outside of the lab? Uh, I really hope so. I think we've certainly held our end of the bargain up. We set ourselves three very clear objectives. One was to demonstrate the power and agility of our system. So to get system uh, products, you know, from an idea or from an existing uh, older system, Excel or another one of our uh, alternative systems that our market uses uh, into our system and demonstrate the speed and agility. We've already done that 
um, with at least two of our mentors. So demonstrating that, and therefore we're already at the stage halfway through the lab where actually we can now take it beyond just an idea and move it into a commercial relationship. Um, we had a couple of other objectives, working on best practice pricing and collaborating with our fellow cohort members. Both those things are going really, really well as well. But to circle back round to your point about moving forward commercial relationships, I'm feeling really good about it. They've been really, really, the people who have engaged with us from our mentors have been incredibly positive, very supportive, and, and I'm feeling good about moving things forward. Now, where you started the business follows some of the conventional wisdom for how people should start businesses, which is you're working in a company, you're trying to get something done, you can't do it, you say, I can do this better myself, and you went off and you you started up a business. So what was the the sort of problem that you had that you couldn't solve that you're now solving with HX? Uh, Really good question. Um, I would say the single biggest challenge we had was speed and agility. Of, of building models, getting them into the hands of our stakeholders, the people that we serve as actuaries. So I'm, when I say we now, I'm going to zoom us back a few years and imagine that I'm the, I was the head of pricing at, uh, at Tokyo Marine Kiln, which is where I was before here. Um, the, one of the biggest challenges we had, and I've learned this through you know the 13 years I was in the market, um, is that actually specialty pricing, it changes changes fast. We work in a really dynamic, interesting, fast-paced market, and we could not find the tools uh, that allowed us to keep p- keep pace, to get the analytical tools into our underwrites' hands at the pace that the market was changing. So our raison d'etre is to, you know, is to build a product that's designed to match the complexion and the nature of the market itself. And that's our, you know, so if, if you have to put, if I had to put one word down, it would be speed. Um, and that's something that we're really, really proud of. And as I said, circling his background to the Lloyd's Lab, motivated by the Rugby World Cup, one of our model developers built a model in 32 hours, right, to get a model into the hands of uh, one of our mentors before he left. So to me, that's the ultimate in, in vindication, is that we, if we can do that sort of thing. Good. And did he, did he underwrite on the back of the model? <laughs> Good question. We'll have to find out about that. <laughs> find out when he comes back. <laughs> Indeed. So we talk about building models. It's like to just take a step through how HX actually operates. So you're essentially building the tools to help the actuaries use, the. I'm assuming it's like lost data from their own experience. Uh, are there other sources of data they would use to build those models that then sit on your tool? Uh, absolutely. So the way we see this is that we want to be a platform, an end-to-end platform for our actuaries, to, uh, the actuaries in our clients' companies to build models, um, to deploy them through to underwriters so underwriters can use them to f- capture data and to generate insights and then to handle all of the other bits in between. So in terms of answering uh, your question about uh, where the models come from, there are clients' models. They, they are either existing models that they've got in spreadsheets or alternative platforms. Uh, they're parameterized from lost data, from underwriter judgment. And increasingly now, and this is one of the things that relates to the, one of those objectives I mentioned with the Lloyd's Lab, is they're pulling data from third-party sources. So if I plug, you know, my, the friends from Insure Data or Climacell, you know, they're using the, the, the data from there to give them extra insights. The way we see our tool is to help pull data from all sorts of sources, historical data, modern uh, API-centric feeds, underwriter judgment, put them into a big pot and get them out there to use and to test very, very quickly. So it's, it's the full gamut of data sources. Right. And I, and I suspect that's a two-stage process, is it? So when your, your clients, are presumably the actuaries and your clients are who your typical users would be, they would they would find the data either from their own losses or, or from third parties or a combination of both. From that, they've got to figure out how they want to build their pricing tools. They then put that into HX, which then allows us to, um, to run that in an underwriting scenario. It's not it's not pulling in data dynamically from the other, the other sources. So you're not, you're not, you're not sort of pricing on the fly. You're actually building the tools in the background. Uh, really good question. So just to help you and do a bit of plug, our product is called Renew. Um, and that's the platform where this happens. Renew has the capability to pull dynamic information in on the fly as well. Some people have static models which exist just pulling data in from uh, their existing data repositories to generate prices. Uh, we have done proof of concepts and we do have some models that we're working on right now where data sources might be pulled from you know anything from like a Google News feed um, or some of the third party data sources. Um, again, like I say, some of the APIs that we mentioned earlier, um, and therefore to add that element of dynamism in the market. Um, and again, that relates to what we were saying about changing fast. And, and what are you seeing as you look out over some of these, these complicated risks in, in the specialty business in terms of sufficient data being available to do the underwriting? Because by their nature, these risks come into London because they're difficult to price. Uh, although everybody recognises the value of data, it's still incredibly difficult to be able to find the data that people actually are comfortable using 
to price. So is that is that kind of going to be the next barrier for you? Now you've built the tools, people are using it, but actually now can they get the data they need to be able to, to do the underwriting? Yeah, so that's a great question, an absolute great question. It actually touches on exactly why we're here. So there's a huge challenge in getting data. You know, I say I was at Gyro, one of the, the most scintillating actuarial conference, uh, one of the most scintillating actuarial conferences in the world. I was talking at that a few weeks ago. And one of the things I said is that if you're waiting to get the data from the broker or in the submission, you're already behind the curve. So people are looking out there. They recognize this challenge of getting data from any, uh, uh, you know, getting the right sort of data to do the analysis. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is make it easier to make it easier, and we use kind of modern open source technology to get data from a variety of different sources. I don't think that's a barrier that we have to overcome next. I think that's a barrier that we're at right now, but our, that our market faces right now. But our product exists to make it easier to get data from all sorts of sources. It's a huge part of what we do. Got it. And, and how do you fit into the underwriting workflow? So you're essentially creating another tool that people have got to figure out where in the workflow does that fit, who runs it? You know, does it become another barrier or can you actually make the whole process more efficient, which is where you know, Lloyd's for one is, is trying to go? How, how do you sort of how do you stop yourselves becoming yet another choke point or a narrow set of skilled users versus you actually are helping reduce the overall cost of the transaction? That's a, a, a big, big challenge. Um, the, that's not a challenge that's a function of the system. It's a challenge of the the kind of work that goes into establishing the pricing workflow. It's something I've talked about at, le at length in the past, again, at some of the presentations I've done, where actually having an unclear underwriter workflow is a huge source. It's a huge source of a pinch point. That's not something that um, is necessarily related to our system or any of our competitive systems. We do spend a lot of time at the very beginning engaging with clients on and on really challenging them, if challenging them on whether they understand clearly their underwriter workflow. Uh, it's almost the sort of thing that the system doesn't cause the blocker. It's the it's actually just not having the process in place to 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 actually understand where we sit. To answer your question as to where we can sit, well, actually, we're a system that can, you know, in our base functionality right now, as as of right now, we can pretty much deal with all the classical actuarial models that people build. As a result, we can sit in the workflow where the underwriter is doing the pricing. We can sit in a workflow where an underwriter fills out a little bit of data. We pull that data from a different system and the actuaries do a slightly more technical analysis. We can fit into any part of that workflow. And one of the things we said when we were pitching for the Lloyd's Lab is we're absolutely an ecosystem play. You know, we are not a monolith. We're not someone that's trying to eat up the entire value chain, sell vendor lock-in for ourselves. That's not something we're trying to do. So we will fit anywhere and we will push and pull data from wherever we need to and trying to be api first api centric in our approach which we've, we have succeeded in allows us to do that and, and where do you sit on this view about legacy because that's often given as the reason why these tools can't be adopted either because just technically it's difficult or impossible or it's just a whole different way of doing things but for you to be successful i mean yes it sounds great to have the apis and certainly we're moving into a new world of platforms but are you able to overcome some of the resistance, both legacy thinking and legacy technology, to get yourselves deployed? Uh, that is a very important philosophical question that I think if I knew the answer to, I'd probably be giving you it from my yacht. Um, so what I would say there is the way we go about this as an early stage, uh, relatively earlier stage startup um, in a market where there's still a huge amount of it being untapped and in old systems. There are people who are very API centric and who are trying to do that right now. We have a very natural and logical appeal to those. The slightly more traditional insurers, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that we have all the answers to every single solution. They, they do find API centric um, uh, platforms harder to deal with. However, what I, to, to go back to the philosophical point, because of that, a whole ecosystem of robotic process autom automation and other tools are popping up to make integration with legacy systems um, much, much uh, more realistic and much more doable. Mercifully, that means we don't have to solve that one ourselves. Um, and as a result, can we integrate with legacy systems? Yes. Is it high priority for us at this point in time? No, but we will, we're working on, and we, there, in fact, in the Lloyd's lab, there are people who are looking at RPA as a solution to that. And on that high priority one, then, I, I guess it also takes me to another question on this, which is if organizations can find ways to better price new products, new risks coming into the market, most people now have heard about the switch from 40 years ago, 80% of risks were tangible physical assets, now 80% are non-tangible, still really hard to 
price many of those predicate are here in the lab doing that for liability cyber is obviously one of the bigger ones is that an area that you're thinking about specifically as where you can really add value because if you if you've got the pricing tools and you're offering a new product you're, or you're enabling other people who've got a new product who cares about legacy you're bringing new revenue into the into the market massively so we just came from a i just come out of another meeting in a demo with another very large lloyd syndicate where we made the joke it's a cyber model that they want to look at working with us on and i always make the joke that do you underwrite risks that are coming to market in 2022 like it's 1996 you know, you, we shouldn't be doing this. It's an area of intense interest to us. We're absolute believers. Again, I would say this as a former uh, head of pricing, that good quality pricing and analytics has a direct impact on the bottom line. We've demonstrated that in our past lives as actuaries, as runners, as leaders of actuarial and analytical teams. D- to answer your question, is this an area that, we, or, or, that we're focused on that's a high priority? Absolutely. And we do believe that people who invest in this now you know, just from a fundamental point of view, you know, the Google guys who said more data is better. You can't apply that in a completely reductive form. But do we believe that in areas like cyber, IP, intangibles, actually, can you get a leg up by doing that first? Yeah, absolutely. But, but do you also have to be slightly schizophrenic with your actuarial background? Because actuaries like to see proof and data sets and you know, risk has to be measured. I mean, if you're looking at some of these tools to move into the non-tangible areas, you know, many of which haven't had losses or, or have losses so rarely that it's very hard to model. I mean, if you're from a personal point of view, I mean, I guess you, you did a startup, so you've already, by definition, you're probably like, you know, a fraction of a cent of any actuary out there, so probably it's not a problem. But is that something you find you've got to reconcile with yourself? Um, no, it's not. I probably, uh, and as you rightly said, I probably fall into a slightly different camp of actuaries. There's a word which I'm a big fan of, and it's called scientism. And it's a belief that if you've got a good formula and a number, you've got the answer every time. Working in this industry, I, I've learned the hard way, having been a guy who loves building a complicated formula as much as the next guy. That, that doesn't mean anything as to its predictive power. Um, and actually, it fits to our core that actually, um, I, you know, I suppose I should centre this on your, on your question. Do I feel schizophrenic? No, because I really firmly believe that we don't have all the data right now to answer these questions. As a result, experimentation and rapid iteration and work, finding out what works and, and doing more of it and doing less of the stuff that doesn't work... Uh, is going to be the going to be the secret. So, is this me being? Do I am I schizophrenic in it? No, I'm very very clear headed that less is more in certain areas. You're you're an actuary for the latter part of the 21st century. That's, that's um, maybe maybe <laughs> excellent. Um, so, are there any anything that's standing out specifically though in that area? Yeah, we've, we've got a lot of things. I suppose the the risk building what you're building is it's a wonderful tool, but can people really focus specifically on what they can use it for? So of all the people you're talking to, or maybe actually you've got clients paying you money, are there anything specifically that stands out as, as you know, where people are starting to use you that you can talk about? Uh, completely. The biggest areas that we're being used for are where people need to do that. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but that's okay, because I think the record's got a good song, um, is where people need to build things quickly. So we're working with one of our clients. They've got big, big challenges to get up and running, get models out to systems really, really quickly. Um, and that's where we really, really uh, uh, can stick head and shoulders above our competitors. You know, things that typically take tens to hundreds of days to get built in a system like ours, we can do much, much more quickly. I am an actuary, so I'm really loath to give performance differences because it'll be a small subset of, the, uh, uh, of samples. But that's a big area. In terms of product lines, we're agnostic. We're being used or being um, on anything from classical liability models through equine, through energy, through to some of the more, more esoteric, you know, we've got a project uh, down the line to work on an IP model that, that's coming through. Um, in terms of that side, no. The characteristics are people who want to pull data from lots of sources and they want to make changes and developments really, really quickly. Yeah, that, that, that con- comment about speed, we're hearing again and again and again. And I, I think the mantra for insurance is not fail fast, is, that, is actually succeed fast. And yeah. You're, you're part of that. And so it's interesting to you. You're saying that the, the data itself is, or the models themselves are less critical, is actually people that want to deploy it and they don't want to get bogged down in. Yeah, friendly old spreadsheets. Massively so. One of our mantras is let HX pull the technology risk away and let you focus on the insurance risk. 
that's what insurance companies set up. I, I learned this having been a software engineer at university. Uh, you know, that, that's one. Of, that was one of my main reasons I ended up with the engineeritis. They call it the delusion that it's oh, I'll do this. I've got this. I can build the system, um, which is wonderful because now we have done it. Actually, it turned out it wasn't so much of a delusion. But um, you know, I think one of the key uh, things is absolutely focus on um, uh, succeeding fast and getting something out there. And the insurance industry loves acronyms. We talk about three-letter acronyms. There are some four-letter acronyms out there. You were talking to me earlier, and you've got a five-letter acronym. <laughs> I have. Yes, Practical Effective Pricing in Specialty Insurance. So I, 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 I seeded this one out there in, uh, at Gyro in Edinburgh a few weeks ago. Uh, absolutely. It, you know, it's something that I've always been very passionate about is building useful, impactful pricing models. I started off with practical, impactful pricing models, uh, 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 pricing, but Pipsy didn't have quite the same ring to it. Um, it's something that we're working on. Um, I'm going to be doing a presentation at the Lloyd's Lab, um, uh, doing the same presentation I did a few weeks ago to get it out to the market more broadly. We're seeing actuaries and data science and analytics teams becoming much more results focused than they have been done in the past. It used to be much more, I, my boss, used, my, my former boss uses the phrase, the yellow cell in the spreadsheet that gave the answer. Right? It used to be about that, whereas now it's actually, how are you making your business better? We're, ex we're expense constrained, we're under huge time pressure, you know, people are saying, do more with your data. Um, and, and that's what Pepsi is about. Brilliant. Well, I'm sure people will remember at least <laughs> the acronym name, even if they can't actually <laughs> take it all to bits and, and repeat it. So, so what's next after the lab for you? A uh, really good question. I, I, you know, I don't want to say it's back to normal business, because actually the lab's been a fantastic catalyst for us. Um, uh, you know, I think pushing further on helping the market or working with the market to uh, to on Pepsi to move things forward in that side of things, um, growing our business, working on sales. You know, one of the wonderful things about the market we work in is actually with our existing clients, there's huge frontiers of unexplored territory. But it's ultimately it's clients, product delivery. Yeah, absolutely. And, we've, and actually, we've got a lot of innovation and experimentation that we want to do over the next year. HX has evolved a lot. You know, we've, we're absolutely very, very client focused and they've got some fantastic ideas. And that's actually the bit that really gets us out of bed is helping them do new things. And so you've got a lot going on, but you've also been good enough to come along and see us uh, at an evening at Instead London for our events. So I'm coming so for years. So, well, yeah, thank you. And so what is it that brings you or keeps bringing you back to what we're, what we're doing? Uh, lots of things. I, I, I think one thing I've learned, having worked uh, in technology for the last couple of years uh, uh, in a dedicated fashion, the power of community is something that's tremendously valuable. I'm a huge believer in it. Um, we went originally to, the, the, to, to your events a little bit somewhat speculatively while HX was a twink twinkle in my eye looking at what other guys were doing. It was hugely valuable to, for us and inspiring actually to see the other guys' success uh, and the tribulations that they go through but what, what it means, what means for them. Um, so originally it was a little bit of inspiration. Over the last couple of years it's been a little bit more about getting on top of the market, understanding a little bit more about what the market is doing. Uh, and in the future, I think it's probably even more about engaging. Maybe you might see me up talking 150 miles an hour on stage at some point. So maybe we're working our way from the back through to the front. I'm not, I'm not sure. We're definitely going to get you on stage. There's a challenge to get 30 minutes of conversation into six minutes on stage. But yes. uh, you've, got, well, yeah, you've got a lot of great things to talk about. Thanks. Uh, good. Well, I mean, that was really, really helpful. If anybody wants to find out more about you, how do they... How do they find you? Loads and loads of different ways. Um, LinkedIn is the natural place in the, in, in the modern social media ecosystem. Uh, you can go to our website if you can spell it, uh, uh, you know, hyperexponential.com. Um, you can reach out through the Lloyd's Lab. There, um, you know, you can find us on Twitter. You can find us, uh, you know, in loads and loads of places. So uh, lots and lots of different ways. And I'm always in the, I'm very regularly in the market and in the, in the lab. You can find me in a coffee shop in the square mile radius, not that difficultly. Good. Well, no excuses then for not, not finding it. And actually just talking about you know, the benefit of London, I just had a conversation earlier on with somebody who'd been at Vegas. And I said, you know, the thing about London, it's like Vegas every day. You've got 7,000 people or more all doing things in technology or within about 10 minutes uh, reach of each other. And, uh, you know, it's a great benefit we have. You know, it's, it's, it's that community, as you say, it's talking about technology and increasingly it's speed and, yeah, prove you can do it. Absolutely. Innovation is about delivery. Otherwise, they're just ideas. I really, exactly doing it. It's really, really true. Good. Well, I'm going to let you get back to all the things you've got to do. Good luck at the end of this cohort when you've got your uh, final presentation. And we look forward to catching up, catching up soon. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. You can find more episodes featuring others in the Lloyd's Labs in earlier recordings and more to come. Now, the Instat London podcast continue to be supported by 
Insurance Insider, and we're delighted to offer you a free issue. Uh, the details are in the episode notes. If you want to find out more about everything we're up to at Instec London, then the best thing is take a look at us on www.instec.london. Uh, and feel free to contact me via LinkedIn or on Matthew at instec.london to tell us what's on your mind. <laughs>